Hello, friends and family. I'm still David Michael Smingy, and I'm a disciple, uh, husband, father, and physician uh, in that order, and doing my best to keep those priorities straight. And my wife is a disciple, a wife, and mother, and patient um, in that order, too, with lots of different things in between patient and physician and mother and father, respectively. Um, but uh, I think we're doing our best to keep priorities straight and do the most we can with the time that we got. And I'll be honest, that time always seems way more short than it already already seems to be, and it just keeps getting shorter, you know. And um, I hope you're doing the same, too, and trying to keep your life and priorities straight as well. Um, it's been about a year since I posted an update, and I just am grateful for all our friends, family who have supported us and prayed for us and just continue to send us notes and messages and encouragement throughout the year. I'm grateful for all of you, and um, it's a really tender and unique place to be, I think, there are just things in the world that um, you really can't describe with words, and that's okay. Um, I think that's where artists and poets do their best to describe things that, like, we know are real, but just you can't quite articulate it. Uh, but um, that's okay, and I, I feel I feel loved, and um, I know Britta does too. And we want to continue to do love and support you all as you love and support us, and we all kind of get through um, life's challenges together and keep encouraging each other to persevere and endure um, to produce hope and character in ourselves. So where does that leave us now? Um, I guess a quick refresher because it's been a minute for you all in terms of where Britta has been. So um, if you remember 2016 July, Britta has her tumor. Um, we do a gross total resection. That means that we take out everything that looks suspicious uh, for tumor, but we know that we don't always win. I mean, tumors are tiny, microscopic. They get places, and especially her tumor, an oligodendroglioma. It's the glue between your brain cells. It, its job is to kind of whittle and wiggle its way into tissue. It's designed to do that or evolved to do that, whatever. Who cares? It does this, you know, and um, you don't get it all. So year goes by, everything looks pretty good, um, and we decide, well, time's short, let's have a kid, and about nine months uh, later, uh, we do, um, and uh, grateful for Perrin, he's growing up, he's in preschool right now, um, he's turning five shortly, um, but uh, we watched British scans for a while, and then around um, uh, September 2019, unfortunately, British tumor recurs, and at that point, she undergoes a subtotal resection, meaning that kind of cut back what you can. Um, you can't get it all. There's just tumor in places that are too important. You can't you can't ethically do these things and make those cuts. Um, I guess you could, um, but it just, it, it's not the right thing to do. And it certainly would come at a great cost to British quality of life, which she's enjoyed quite a bit of. Um, so then after that, um, Britta undergoes uh, one of two different types of chemotherapy that we have for brain tumors. One of them is called PCV. It's the older one. She does that for about a year, goes through most of 2020 on chemotherapy, um, and then 2021 happens. Not too much in terms of tumor changes, but end of 2021 happens, and then um, one part of her tumor just grows just a little bit too much. We're like, that's a little suspicious, so she undergoes radiation in January of 2022. Um, and then I have one of the, you know, kind of worst times I get to have too and get to scrape all her hair off her head. And it's a memory I don't want to have, but I have it and I get to keep it. And we get to share that painful moment and persevere together through it. Um, but Britta loses a good chunk of her hair and also starts a different chemotherapy called TMZ. Um, TMZ is Timazar, Team Odar, and it's a Medication you can take, it's oral, it's about, take it five days every 28 days, and it's a decently tolerated chemotherapy medication. Um, sometime through that, Britta has a positive pregnancy test, okay, real or not, it's a big question. We didn't know, uh, kind of freak out about it, was not expecting that, and I know I'm a doctor, like I know how this works, I was not expecting a positive pregnancy test um, in any way. Um, but, you know, those kind of things can happen, and I really mixed feelings about it, I guess, what do you do with that information? So um, either way, Britta ends up having uh, HCG levels and pregnancy levels that just kind of taper off. Either it was a fluke or it was just uh, uh, it's just it's kind of in that gray zone of po above this number is definitely positive and below this number is definitely negative. But then there's this gray zone of most labs and she was just in that gray zone of maybe positive for a while. And eventually it becomes negative. So miscarriage or not, who knows? Um, or what that was, um, it doesn't appear to have come back. So Britta goes through more chemotherapy and is finishing up right now round um, 12 of Timidar. Um, but keep doing scans throughout this, okay? 
So most scans were boring um, through December of last year, um, just, what, four months ago. And then about a month ago, um, get a terrible kind of scan, you know, and just, it's not great news, okay? Um, it just is what it is. And uh, essentially what happened is uh, between the December scan and then the March scan, so about three month time span, a 10 millimeter nodule appears. And that 10 millimeter nodule is new, despite being on chemotherapy and was enhancing, meaning that it, means that it takes up contrast, it applies it's kind of a vascular structure, something's happening, there's blood trying to get to it, okay? And then that's lesion number one of two. The second lesion is in a cerebellum. If you imagine a, a brain, okay, that kind of bottom thing, you have the big top lobes and the bottom thing that kind of sticks out at the bottom of it. Um, that's uh, kind of closer to where her tumor edge is. There's a thing there too um, that's been growing much more, in the words of radiology, conspicuously. Uh, meaning that if you go back to some of really, really early scans, it's something that isn't quite there. And then we slowly, slowly see this thing growing. So two lesions, one that appeared kind of suddenly, 10 millimeters, and one that um, subtle kind of growing conspicuously. Okay. Regardless, Brita pretty much symptom free, no seizures, good quality of life, um, enjoying being a preschool mom and uh, being involved in the preschool co-op. So um, yeah, so what do you do the information? So about a month ago, I said, God, you know, I knew 10 millimeter nodule despite chemotherapy that was not there three months ago. That's not great news by any stretch of the imagination. So I drove home, and I, left, I left work, like I can't work today. Um, went home and told my son, hey, you know, it's four. Like, what do you tell your kid? And what do you tell your wife? You know, you tell them the truth. And you say, mom's skin doesn't look good. Looks real bad, looks really bad. Um, and, you know, if you kind of do the math on something like that, you know, if it is an aggressively growing nodule, you think, well, God, it was there you know, um, 10 millimeters three months ago, or three, grew, grew 10 millimeters in three months, and then you think, well, next three months will be about 20 millimeters, you know, and then next um, month will be about 40 millimeters, and then next, you know, three months will be about 8D millimeters. And at that point, you run out of brain space, your brain herniates, and you die. You know, so you think, well, God, maybe there's about 12 months left to live or something like that. Um, so that, that would be bad, okay? So um, I talked to a lot of people. <laughs> like, I just kind of was processing it. And, you know, what do you do with that information? I mean, you still live your life and you still, you, know, you sit back and you think, well, what's important? And if Brita is going to pass, what do we start doing now to make things matter? You know, you do your best to record information, in little notes for parent and me. And if you just prepare for it, right? Um, so um, we talked to, um, you know, oncology and, you know, the question at that point was still, you know, we know these lesions can appear suddenly, um, but, uh, you know, the question at that time was really, is this something that is a new growing tumor or is this something that is necrotic dead tissue, essentially a form of brain gangrene? You know, you want to kill things in your brain. That's why we're doing chemotherapy and radiation, right? Um, but, you know, sometimes new stuff that shows in your brain shows up like, well, dead stuff can sometimes look at this, like necrosis can show up like this, you know, and they're basically indistinguishable. It's awful, you know, in that if you get a new lesion, the treatment for it essentially is try and kill it as much as possible. If it's a necrotic dead lesion or dead thing, just dead tissue, it looks an awful lot like a tumor that grew, but if you kill it, it's, you can't kill someone's already dead. You just kind of, the collateral damage of that is enormous. So you're stuck. You can't really do anything about it. And I'll show you some links and kind of some pictures of what this might look like and why it's so challenging, you know, so what you do in that situation is you wait about a month and scan again, um, which is what we did. And fortunately, you know, fortunately, not unfortunately, um, you know, that lesion essentially didn't change at all. So we had a three month period where this thing shows up and then um, one month goes by, no change at all. So at least the hyper aggressive version is gone. And that's wonderful news that gives us more time and certainly changes our timeline um, you know, from a death by Christmas to like death, hopefully not by Christmas, um, like hopefully much, much longer than that. Um, but you still keep watching these things, so you don't quite know, but at least that's a bit of good news. You know, the, uh, the unfortunate news with this is lesion number two, the more conspicuous one. And that one seems to just kind of keep marching on really slowly. All right. Um, despite chemotherapy. Um, so what do you do with that information? Well, you, you keep watching it. I mean, essentially this kind of lesion goes to a tumor board and they look at it and say all the all the king's horses all the king's men kind of people who are neurosurgeons oncologists they all get together and they look at this lesion they're like what do you do with this and uh 
an institution, they say, well, just watch it and see what happens, which, what do you do? I mean, pretty completed essentially are only options for brain tumor treatment. You've got surgery, you've got radiation, which basically is shotgunning chimeric technique, if we're honest. Um, and then you've got uh, chemotherapy PCV, chemotherapy Timodar. And from there, there's not too much FDA approved kind of stuff to do unless you want to start thinking of trials. But even then, those are questionable too in terms of efficacy. And you, know, you think of trials, you always end up different control groups. There's a lot of ethics involved in that. Not going to bore you too much with it. Um, but right now, um, talked to oncology today, kind of with that information, and we had a good discussion about what options do we have. And the plan right now, essentially, is Britta's going to finish out Timodar. So he's going to finish essentially both chemotherapies over a pretty good chemo, uh, length of time. Um, and then what's also kind of happened is something I think we've been kind of hoping for is that new technologies kind of come along. So there's been new immunotherapies, kind of things that target specific cell markers within a cancer cell um, that have come out, you know, that are certainly being studied in terms of efficacy and things like um, uh, oligodendrogliomas or really any brain tumor, mostly gliomas or glioblastoma. Um, and there's a great clinical trial looking at one and some FDA approved medi uh, medication essentially for those who care, it's the IDH1 inhibitors that are available, but there's newer ones that look a bit better that have brain penetration. So the thought is, well, maybe we we wait a minute, you know, to have that one get FDA approved, or when is that one get FDA approved? When do you start these medications? It's a tough question, you know. So I think, for better or for worse, Brit is kind of riding a wave of discovery in terms of all. Well, hopefully, every couple of years that go by, there's maybe a new option to try, you know, and it, it just buys for enough time to the next one. Even looking at study, studies for the the IDH1 uh, checkpoint inhibitors, you know, or IDH1 and 2 checkpoint inhibitors. Um, uh, um, it's not getting my stuff mixed up, but you get the idea. These new medications, you know, you can buy yourself about 36 more months or so with her particular tumor. And in the contrast enhancing ones, not so much the, the one that potentially is hopefully just um, uh, brain necrosis. Um, but in the non-contrasted uh, tumor piece, the one that's growing slowly, um, that's what this medication is engineered to fight and, and does really well with. Um, so here's hoping, you know, that we keep kind of writing new medications and other things too. And then, of course, in the meantime, like, what do you do? You know, we, it's, I'll be honest, it's really frustrating to live life, you know, every one to two to three months finding out if my wife's going to live and um, what's going to happen. And you just keep going on. You know, I, I don't think tomorrow is ever guaranteed for anybody. You know, we find that out every day. People lose their lives very unexpectedly. So I, I hope and encourage all of you too to keep living and getting the most you can out of your life too, and hopefully finding ways to serve others and do good in it. I mean, what could be better than trying to help other people um, get through this really difficult thing that we call life, um, but also a really beautiful thing that we call life too. So I hope that you're finding beauty in things and finding hope in things. And, um, you know, let's continue to pray with us. You know, the prayer continues to be like, God, I just hope that Perrin grows up with his mother, mother in a very literal sense, you know, not a metaphorical one, um, selfishly. Um, and then, of course, just uh, oh, pray for me. I mean, I, I work a job. You know, I'm a physician, and, you know, it's not easy. No job's easy. Um, I just, it's challenging work, and I'm grateful to go and do it and grateful to serve people. Um, I'm doing my best to try and figure out, like, how do I... To, to, how do I process life and work? Like if I take off time now, well, does it mean that I lose it later? How do I, how do I best balance not knowing like the chaos of life with also the, you know, realities of life? Like I, I want to spend time with my family and my wife and I also want to figure out how to do my job well um, and support my family through that and support my patients and residents and what I get to do there. So um, thank you very much um, for all the, listening that you do. I think it's probably the most therapeutic thing that you can do to another person is to just have them verbalize their thoughts and be that listening, supportive person for someone else. And you all certainly do that for me. And I'm, I'm grateful for you. And I, I just hope and pray that God blesses you and keeps you and brings you peace too. I'll try my best to update a bit more frequently, uh, but uh, thank you for forgiveness and grace and patience with me too. So take care.